So um, I'm gonna present the, the result of a research that we did uh, a couple of years ago with me and Wu and Gregor Murray on the uh, the transformation of photo service. Uh, I will skip some detail because Bernard and Emmanuel gave us some detail about the nature of the sector, which is different from the construction of automotive is the downstream, which repair body shops, mechanics, selling. So um, our point of departure was Uh, the the research problem was around the uh, impact on technology and, and climate change on scale. Uh, we see a lot of work being done, whether it's techno optimism, techno pessimism, uh, everything will be perfect, fully automated luxury communism, whatever. I mean, we you you get all all all, all sort of speculation. Our uh, Point of departure was there's insufficient empirical work, and we need to contextualize those changes in specific industry and specific region that are really the the recipient of these technological change and how actors and institutions institution that that were built around those sector and and region are uh, digesting in a way these technological change. Of course, uh, there's neoliberal pressures on collective skills regime, which is the case that we will study. Uh, the auto services in Quebec was historic, historically constructed uh, uh, around collective skill regime. So our core proposition is that uh, it's a wide proposition, but it's digital technology and climate change represent a critical junctures that can potentially decivilize skill settlement and a political compromise and parity mechanism underlying it. So um, we think that these pressure are exerted on institutionally embedded compromises that may come unstuck or may remain stable depending on the forces that are at play, but also the actor's experimentation. Get back her feet uh, in the crimped uh, gabari uh, framework, whatever. Uh, we were mostly uh, inspired by the uh, historical institutionalism uh, work from Kathleen Keelan on skill regime, uh, that skill regime are built around critical junctures of political actors and, and, and power relation at certain time. She gave the example of the German uh, skill regime that was built around the 19th century that has uh, changed, but being preserved in its uh, boundaries and actors. There's also key variable to consider. Uh, size of firm uh, will in the regime will impact their skill set. If you have small firm versus large firm that are dominant in the sector, it will impact the, the nature of the compromises. The state involvement, the role of partisan politics, class division, and uh, the, the, the degree to which employer and their interests are collectively organized. Uh, Another inspiration was the concept of skill settlement from James, uh, James, James was, uh, I think it was an ex US president in the 1970s, James, um, one year term. Um, <laughs> it's really that industry and region are characterized by their own particle of skill settlement is the institutionally compromise between key actors and social partners. So we may, we must, focus on the interest and importance of looking at the impact of digital and climate disruption in these particular skill set settlement. And of course, the uh, topic of today's paritary mechanism, uh, the auto services in Quebec uh, are characterized by paritary uh, mechanism. So uh, disruption might lead, uh, we forget, might lead to the renegotiation and transformation of these regimes. So. We have uh, four key factors that we wanted to analyze to analyze the collective nature of the skill regime uh, uh, from Buzmeyer and Trent Push uh, in 2012. First, uh, what is the nature of skill require, required in, in this collective skill regime? Uh? Second, who provides the training? Is it education, the workplace, employers, firm, state predominance? Third factors is who pays for training? Is it the trainee? Is it the state? Is it uh, co-finance uh, between the trainees and also the firm? So it's really important to uh, who pays for training. 
And uh, fourth factor to a nice collective skill regime, who control the certification of skill? Is it craft union, like in the case of construction? Is it the industry bodies, parity mechanism, the state? In the case of the auto sector, it's through the parity mechanism uh, that the certification of skill is made. Two uh, factors, uh, according to Busmeyer and Trempush, that will uh, impact on the score uh, uh, aspect of the skill settlement. First, the logic of membership. So is there a degree of coordination between actors and particularly between business? We saw in the case that France, you get strong coordinating uh, uh, coordination between actors. So we think that as firm will develop new business model, it might whether uh, exacerbate or attenuate the slavage around the skill settlement and the collective nature of the regime. So business model might lead to a kind of disintegration of those uh, membership around businesses, or it might reinforce uh, toward other actors like the state or the union. Second uh, explanatory factor, logic of influence. So the power relationship and interest between actors we think that digital and climate disruption cause shift in power relation uh, between trade union, business, uh, labor, uh, political party, and might unsettle or open up existing skill uh, settlement and collective nature of the regime. So much more uh, uncertainty between uh, the skill regime and those changes. Research design, I will go quickly. We did uh, 161 interviews in the auto services in Quebec. So all subsector, reparation, uh, uh, distribution, body shop, uh, recycling, et cetera, all the family, actually, Christmas party, we did interview. It was, it, it was an adventure. You interviewed himself when he was driving the car. Exactly. <laughs> well, well, and, and me and while having a baby. So uh, everyone was involved in that. Um, yeah, it was surprising in a way. It's just an anecdote, but people were rec recruiting themselves in the project because they were so interested to give their opinion because they were hearing that we were doing the studies and they said, yeah, I want to say my opinion because my my the other sector might say something that I don't like, so I should. I should. So, we'd say after three hours, stop that. No, I want to continue. Yeah, I want to continue. So it was, usually it's it's different when you do qualitative work. You're, you're the harassing researcher that always asks more questions. But anyway, one particular uh, particularity is that the regime is collective by nature, but you get different forces. You have the parity mechanism uh, with the decree system. You got multi-employer bargaining, uh, mostly in the dealership, but they are not connected that much between the decree and the, uh, the collective uh, bargaining uh, in different regions. You have also a sectoral committee that is mostly for skills and, 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 uh, and labor market issues. State is involved also with um, uh, public education because the curricula are mostly uh, obtained through uh, school. So a really complicated sector. Uh, what was the contour of the uh, skill settlement before the 1990s? You had a relatively stable skill settlement, I will say skill were uh, industry specific. There were uh, weak general skills, but some of the workers had uh, a DFP, so what we call high school degree to get uh, the skill uh, needed. So it was a patchwork between uh, non-mandatory, mandatory, mandatory uh, skill, uh, apprenticeship uh, and, and so on. Who provided the training? Uh, dual track, state was providing some training, but there was also skill specific training in enterprise. So really also patchwork. It's not, uh, I will say ver vertically integrated like you see in France with this kind of like uh, regulation that are really tight. It was supposed to be like that, but for different reasons, it's mostly patchwork. So who pays for training? It was state in, in a way, apprentice also, and small industry levy for certification. And who was certifying uh, the training? Uh, it's mostly through parity, parity committees. So it was not compulsory, but people could uh, obtain these uh, certification through the parity committee. So um, how much time? Yeah. Si j'ai 15 minutes. Yeah. 5 minutes. On va passer à la prochaine. 
So a uh, disruption, I think Emmanuel and Bernard did a great job at our disruption. I won't repeat, but you have pervasive uh, diagnostic tool, electronics in, in uh, automotive. I mean, the semiconductor crisis that we had in the past two years is, is one proof that a car now is really complicated. It's a computer's on wheel. So uh, the connected car, new modes of propulsion that are really important. Also hybrid and electronic car. You don't repair a car. Uh, like you did with the internal combustion engine, engine sorry, uh, propulsion. New modes of consumption also, because you have some tension of like uh, sharing with Communauto that we have in Quebec, but I guess in Europe, you also have this car sharing. So people might not, I don't know, buy a car and will share the car. It's relatively true because we see since the pandemic uh, a rise in terms of buying cars. So this kind of model is not that much. And also new model, uh, business model, Tesla, for instance. Tesla is doing its own servicing. You, there's no dealership. There's no, you must have the codes to repair Tesla. So it's really important also to have this um, in mind. And another uh, factor is there's some regulatory pressures because Quebec, say, I said uh, two years ago in 2035, it, no car, no ice car will be sold anymore. So you have this deadline that is uh, facing the actors in the sector. So, so the disruption skills, uh, deficiency is in general skill. There's also multiple skills gap and recurs to firm specific skills. So there's a tension between this trade that is encompassing like uh, Bernard and Emmanuel said toward a more tailorized uh, division of, of labor. In terms of uh, the curricula, uh, there's a chronic labor shortages that I like deficiency in vocational training and mentorship, mostly because it's not mandatory. It's not adapted to those pressure, uh, technological pressure. Training is the same, but training is, is characterized by a multiplication of training, uh, uh, your, uh, so uh, the site of, of training. So you have classical school curricula, you have uh, small uh, training of two days by, uh, a distributor, for instance, uh, it's, it's funny because people that distribute the, uh, the parts uh, will train the mechanics in the body shop or in the, uh, the, the shop because they are, um, they are uh, worried about the guarantee because people are repairing the car and they break the, the parts. So the, the distributor is giving some training. Anyway, multiple site. And also there's a pressure on certification because uh, the pressure on certification uh, is, is, is high because uh, there's a demand to address uh, skill gaps. Oh, I will go quickly. Um, conclusion, if we want to have some time to discuss because I see there's 10 minutes left. Uh, the conclusion is that the environmental and technological change have destabilized the past collective skills regime. Uh, it was centered around parity institution and processes, but we, we, we posed the question, uh, are we uh, in front of a fissuring skills regime and a decrease influence for paritarism, which means that the institution are still there, but there's multiple tension in the institution because of those changes. Uh, there's an uneven impact on skill. Yes, you have new skills to bend, but actors are still powerful to regulate the, the trades and, and they, their unions are really attached to the unity, unicity of trade because it's because of autonomy, but also power. Uh, uh, because when you have a single trade, you have more, more power in the shops. And uh, there's a proliferation of training initiative, like I said. So there's some collective initiative, but not enough to fill the scale gap that we see today. And there's, Bernard was asking, are we seeing a decoupling of the regime? We, we notice it in the working condition. We have the dealership that are uh, pushing the standards up, good working condition, $30 an hour, pension fund, multi-employer uh, collective bargaining, but you have the downstream that is disconnected from those regulation and the decree do not fill this gap because decree are, are barely minimum wages now. There are even some years where the decree was not renewed that the minimum wage for a trainee was below the minimum wage in Quebec. So um, why, why this divided 
peritarism. Um, I think uh, first there's a factor of, there's an intensifying cleavage between business model of the upfront market, big rivalry between the uh, dealership that have direct access to technology, direct access to the brands and the more independent aftermarket. So the logic of membership that was pretty stable in the past because of those tensions and where the value is located has kind of dislocated this, this kind of, uh, I would say, a relative peace in the sector between the small and the, uh, the small enterprise and the dealership. Uh, the logic of influences is relatively stable. Union as employers are uh, somehow cordial and, and union are able to mobilize their institutional legacy. The passive actor right now is the state. The state enact an obligation to convert vehicle, but do not give the tools and the resources to the actors to kind of deal with these, these, uh, these changes. And, and as a conclusion, we think it's really important, like our research, as demonstrated to locate those change in specific skill settlement, which are really the nature where, where the action is actually. So thanks a lot.